nasty. Yeah, big nasty Hall of Fame Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan, baby. And you're watching Ten and Fire Podcast, brother. No other rock and roll. If you ain't watching, you ain't listening, and you're missing out. Woo! The Cannon Fire Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Cool Towel. The Cool Towel is an all-natural, instant cooling towel. No water, no refrigeration, no prep of any kind needed before use. Just take them out of the resealable pouch, shake it up, and it's good to go. It's that simple. When you're finished, put them back in the resealable pouch for use later on. You can find them online at CoolTowel.com, the official sponsor of CFP. We need one, one day, one win, one family, one day, one win, one family, one time. We got one time to do this. We got one time. Let's go. It's time to go to work. One time on two. One, two, three, four, five. Seconds left, ready to go. The snap. Winston looking, looking, looking. Fade route, far sideline. It is on ball. It touchdown, Tampa Bay. Touchdown, Chris Godwin. Touchdown, Tampa Bay. Bucks lead. Fire them cannons. You got a nice computer warning sound to welcome you back to a brand new episode of the Cannon Fire Podcast here on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play Music. And we are pretty much a week away from regular season Buccaneers football. I couldn't be more excited. And Evan, I'm sure you are just as excited as we welcome you back once again to a brand new episode of CFP here today. Happy Labor Day, everybody. Weekend, and I hope you are ready to get back to work tomorrow because uh, I know that I am not. If you're new around here, I am your host, Rhett. Joined alongside me, as always, is my co-host and good buddy, Mr. Bucks Football, Evan. Evan, how are you doing on this Labor Day? Doing just fine. Uh, I, I heard you say less. Uh, it's it's a, about a week away. It's less than a week away. This time, this time next week, we're gonna we're gonna know whether the Buccaneers are zero and one, one and zero, or if they tied. So, so it is officially time to get back to work for the Buccaneers here on Labor Day. Like you said, man, six days away. Uh, <laughs> how would you feel if they tied? If they ended up tying, uh. I'd be more surprised I, I than know. anything. I don't. I, I don't know how I would feel. I mean, I'd be happy I, yeah, because I, we didn't lose on the never road. Never happened to me. Yeah, yeah I, it's <laughs> never happened to me. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a soccer fan, so I don't. All the sports I watch, there, there's always a winner. Yeah, and that'd be the first time I've ever seen. I don't remember the last time the Bucks tied a game. Definitely, I. I for as long as I've been watching, they haven't tied one. And, and crazy thing is, too, you know, you talk about ties in the NFL. Even just this past couple of years, I feel like we've had more and more kind of creep up. I think we've had at least one a season for the past few years. Am I wrong? Yeah, and I think it always involves the team like the Niners or like the Rams the or Cardinals. Something. Yeah, exactly. One, the, them, them AFC, NFC West teams, those type of teams. I don't know why, but yeah. Maybe it's the time difference that just, uh, I don't know. I don't know. But let's jump into some Buccaneers news and get you guys ready for the preseason. We're coming off the heels of a pretty okay preseason for the most part. A lot of holes still in the team that we are going to talk about a little bit later today, but a lot of things that looked great, uh, which, like I said, we are also going to talk about a little later today. But to catch you up on what's happening most recently, the Buccaneers did re-sign long snapper Garrison Sandboard. Now, he was initially cut, like, yesterday, right? Uh, Yeah. And, and they bring him back. He stuck around for a little while, so he does have another spot on the team. But something else I kind of wanted to jump into, you know, because... Oh, and also, before we really get going, Buccaneers have only tied once in our history. Okay, do you know who it was against? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I don't know who it was against, but it was 1980, so they were still in the Central Division, so... All right, so we do know that the Bucks tied once. It was in the Central Division in 1980. If you guys can tell us the opponent, then, hell, you'll get a shout-out on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, make sure you follow us there. But uh, I wanted to jump in and and ask really quick, what's up with Mitch Unrein? Mitch Unrein, I believe he was put on concussion protocol, moved over to injury reserve. 
Um, and even for a concussion, <clears throat> you brought up, and a lot of other people have said, he's been out for a long period of time, but now it's at the point where we're this close to the season, he's going to have to be forced to miss eight games on the injury reserve list. What's what's up there? Well, uh, it's a concussion, yeah. it's They it suffered two weeks in the training camp, and you know each concussion is different. I remember I, I tweeted out, I remember that Thursday night game when Mike Evans had that nice one-handed catch. He got hammered and ended up going into concussion protocol. And they ended up playing 10 days later. They ended up playing the Bears, and Mike Evans played in that game. Now you have Mitch Unrein, who had an injury the second week of training camp and missed, didn't play one preseason game. Um, I got an interesting tweet here from the guys who are at the Pewter cast, uh, Brent Brent Allen, he does. He has a great job. Um, him, him, and uh, him and Ren do a great job over there. Uh, but he tweeted at me and said, you know, in 2016, most NFL players in the concussion protocol missed two games, some less, some more. But that's about 14 to 21 days. Outside of football, though, the average recovery time for a concussion is around 43 days, according to WebMD. Unrein is cur- currently on day 25-ish. Well, WebMD, so, might be a I've little also, bit. I've gone on WebMD just for some symptoms and found out that I was going to die in a couple of hours, and here I am. So, but um, well, I mean, I had I had a concussion once that took me a, a few took me about a month or so. Yikes! That sucks, man. Can't say I've ever had a concussion. Had some bad injuries, but never a concussion. Now, the uh, the tweet you had sent out that he was replying to, you know, that was initially what had sparked my interest because I hadn't thought about it. You know, Mitch Unrein was. I don't want to say an afterthought because he is a free agent addition that they brought in this offseason. He's here to do good things. But, um, you know, the way you had stated it was like, did he get hit in the head with a bag of bricks or something? Because yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. He's I just been tweeted, out for a very long time. I just, a- I just asked. I said, did he Did he get – did Mitch Unrein get hit hit his head with a bag of bricks? <laughs> and I said, I've never seen a concussion in the NFL key player out so long. And then I said – I know there are probably different situations, but remember when Mike Evans got the concussion after he made that one-handed catch on Thursday night yeah. and then played the next game, which was 10 days later. Unrein has been out over a month. Now, everyone is different. Everybody's brain's going to react different to a certain injury. Whether I mean, not only brain, it's your body. So, I mean, everybody's been telling me, you know, when they put him on IR, um, so they were able to sign Garrison Sanborn back. And everybody's saying, what? He's going to be out in eight weeks. A concussion is not going to keep him out eight weeks. Yes, you're probably right. By the end of week nine, by the end of the eight weeks, he should be fine. Like, after week three or maybe after week two or so, he should be fine. But the problem is, when you put a guy on IR, it, it's a rule. You, you, you're acquired. That player cannot come back until eight weeks has passed. It just it can't happen. It, it happened to Charles Sims' his rookie year. Um, you you can't do it. Uh, so it's not like the Bucks think he's going to be out eight weeks. It's just that's what they had to do. And they didn't, it was either do that or cut him. Yeah, and Charles Sims, as you brought up, a guy who's not even on the team anymore because of the uh, injury reserve situation there. But what we do know is that everybody heals differently. Uh, Mitch Unrein should be fine, but a minimum of eight weeks, I would say, expected to be missed uh, under that IR rule. But let's move on and talk about the Buccaneers preseason, which is now behind us. Bucks came out, went 2-0, and looked good against Miami, looked good against um, the Browns, excuse me. And then after that, played the Lions and the Jags, didn't look so good there. Now, the Lions game is, is probably my favorite game of the preseason um, well, they 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 played the Titans week too, not the Browns. Titans, there we go. I, I don't know. Preseason's kind of behind us. I, <laughs> I, I was a little off there, but forgive me for that one. All right. So basically, what we're going to be talking about coming off of the preseason, Bucks go two and two. We're gonna break down the strengths and weaknesses. Basically, what looked good from the team and and what really didn't look good from the team and and some question marks here as we head into week one on the road against New Orleans coming up in just six days. So let's start with the strengths. Your first group is, I mean, it's obviously your biggest strength here, but the Buccaneers wide receiver core right now is possibly the deepest and most rooted with talent in the NFL. And I can I can strongly say that because we've seen a lot out of these guys, especially ones 
who did make the team. So the Bucks did decide on carrying six, uh, six receivers on the roster into the regular season. You've got Mike Evans, Deshaun Jackson, Chris Godwin, Adam Humphreys, Freddie Martino, and Justin Watson, who brings up the rear in that sixth spot. Now, the rookie Justin Watson, you know, we had talked about after the first game, and I believe the Titans game, he was, I, I wouldn't say in an area of concern, but he did have some holes, and, and he had some passes he should have caught, something that might not have looked good when he was chasing that last wide receiver spot, but he ultimately makes the team, and you can solemnly say this kid's pretty talented. Yeah, oh, I, I I was a big fan of the, the Justin Watson pick uh, when it happened, and you know, yeah, he didn't have a good... He didn't really have that good of a, a game in Miami, which was concerning. He had the fumble, which led to a Miami touchdown, I believe. It was a touchdown. Um, and then it was preseason, you know, he, man. Forget most of it. <laughs> he came. He came out. He came out in, in Tennessee, and look, I mean, he caught a touchdown from James Winston, and then he caught he caught some other balls that game. And then in the second half of the Lions game, he caught, I believe, five balls. And then he caught a touchdown the fourth preseason game. So and he's been he's been a consistent player in practice. So, so that's a guy who's earned his spot on this team. And I really liked him is Jason Light. That's one of his guys. You know, he he always gets them them guy. You know what I'm talking about, man. He, he yeah. always gets them yeah. them small school type guys. I mean, Penn. Obviously, I've heard of it because I, I live in Pennsylvania. But actually, Ryan. Ryan Griffin actually asked me if I was going to go to Penn while, while with just like Justin Watson, but I didn't answer him um, <laughs> because when I met him, he said, "Yeah, okay, you're going to end up going to Penn." I was like, "Oh, uh, maybe." <laughs> um, anyways, I mean, I just—he's a hard-working dude. He doesn't drop the ball. He, you know, the, the fumble surprised me. It did, but I mean, he hasn't really had many flaws since. So, yeah, he's he's earned this spot and. Uh, of course, Freddie Martino got the sixth one. They they were only expected to carry five, but yeah. the way the receivers played in the preseason, they felt like they had to keep six. They had to keep one of them, one extra one. And that's something I wanted to bring up too. You know, Justin Watson, he was a guy. He's the rookie wide receiver, uh, the rookie wide receiver, excuse me. And you know, he did have a lot of strengths, and I felt pretty good ultimately watching him. You know, there was competition for him there in that position on the last uh, roster spot. But I kind of felt like he was going to make the team. I didn't feel too unsure of him making the team. Now, when you focus over on Freddie Martino, who makes the team, you're comparing him to guys like Bobo Wilson, uh, Bernard Reedy, who I personally wanted to make the team. Um, but a lot of competition there. And like you said, it was pretty fun to watch the receivers all preseason long. Yeah, I mean... There was, I mean, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Adam Humphries, Deshaun Jackson, of course. But then you had Justin Watson, Bernard Reedy, Freddie Martino, Bobo Wilson, Sergio Bailey. I mean, you had a lot of these guys step up. And I still think Sergio Bailey would have made a fight for that sixth spot if he hadn't got injured. It's a shame. I, th I have a feeling he'll be back next year. He's not picked up by somebody, though. Oh, yeah. And going back to the other positions on the Bucks roster as we wrap things up for the wide receiver strengths. You've got Mike Evans, Deshaun Jackson, Chris Godwin, Hump. That's all starting ability guys. And you can make the argument against Hump, but when it comes to Adam Humphreys, all these past couple of years, all we've seen from him is consistency. He's available. He's in the right place at the right time. We talked about that a few weeks ago here on the show. So a really good-looking position there at wide receiver for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Moving on to another strength, kind of in the same group here, but the tight ends. You've got O.J. Howard, who is poised to have another breakout year. Um, you've got Cameron Brait, Bucks run a two tight end set most of the time. But, you know, including the tight ends, you overall look at this air attack set up for Jameis Winston, Ryan Fitzpatrick, the first three games. Pretty good shape here for the, uh, for the passing offense, I'd say. Yeah, and I mean, Scott Reynolds had put out his strengths and the weaknesses. And I mean, both of these, the wide receivers and the tight ends, are both in the strengths. And I mean, I think if you'd ask, probably 95% of Bucks fans would say that these two positions are, are strengths of the team. I, I don't know. And those 5%, I don't know how they justify saying that they're not strengths. Um, because, I mean, obviously, there, there are some areas on the team that aren't really a strength, but it's not really a weakness, you know. But I think it, it's clear that these two areas are our strengths, and just like you said, I mean OJ Howard, primed for for a 
just a dominant season. Uh, I saw saw a couple of flashes of it, especially in that Detroit game, which he shouldn't have been called for pass interference. Oh yeah, that was ridiculous, uh, man. He literally just carried his momentum into the catch. Yeah, I, and, and you know it's it's a shame, but I mean it was a good play. That was, but that's the explosive play that they were talking about. They need more of that, and that's what OJ's hoping to provide. Um, and of course, you know we we'll always talk about oh OJ Howard a breakout season. This team still has Cameron Bray, you know. Yeah. Cameron Breakout re-signed. He's here for six more years. He's here for six more years. So, I mean, he's Jameis Winston's go-to guy in the red zone. Maybe O.J. Howard can earn that trust. Maybe. But right now, the chemistry between Jameis Winston and Cameron Bray is still there. And it's still, I think, some of the best quarterback to tight end in, in chemistry in the league. I don't think, I mean, that every time Jameis throws the ball to Bray, it's spot on and, and most likely it's a catch. Yeah, and Cam Braid is a guy, I remember it vividly a year ago, I made a bold prediction that Cam Braid was going to finish the year with double-digit touchdowns. I said at least 10, and how many did he finish with last year? Six. Him six. and okay. him and, so him, was... and, him and OJ both finished with six. Okay, so 12 total touchdowns for that tight end core with those two guys. So I was and, I, and I think I think OJ Howard's going to get double-digit touchdowns this year. That's what I'm calling. Okay, now I you think see o- both of them. No. Well, no. No, no. Uh, as Cameron soon as I Bray's said gonna... that out loud, I kind of reeled it back in. Let me settle down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James Winston's going to be the first quarterback ever to throw for 7,000 yards um, and w- while missing the first three games. For, <laughs> yeah. For, <laughs> um, anyways, uh, yeah, I, I think Cameron Brate's going to take kind of a step back, but it's not going to be because Cameron Brate's production bad. dips. It's it's Yeah, it's not going to be bad. It's, it's going to be... Because splitting the workload, and, and it's gonna be because Howard's doing so good. Like that's like, it's it's not like everybody says, you know, like oh, you're a bad team if you don't do this. Well, you know, just be, you might be a good team, but you're not as good as somebody else. That doesn't make you a bad team. Cameron Braid's a good player. Is he as good as OJ Howard? I don't know. I know OJ Howard's ceiling is definitely higher, and I think OJ Howard's production i think you're gonna see is gonna be much more than Cameron bright this year but i mean this team when they're when they're down inside the 10 yard line they're putting in bright and that's who the ball is going to yeah. um but you also have anthony Auclair and alan cross who i mean alan Cl- yeah, cross alan is cross just really a, came a consistent <laughs> he's just a, a consistent guy who who works hard catches the ball does the dirty work and anthony Auclair is expected to have more of a role in the offense uh, this year. So, um, I mean, he got he got a few looks last year, uh, and he's he's expected to have uh, a bigger role in this offense. I'm not saying he's gonna, you know, catch I don't you know five touchdowns or whatever, but he'll he'll get his receptions there, and, and they'll put him in for some blocking things as well. So, very very deep group. Oh yeah, looking good for that Bucks air attack headed into this upcoming season. Now, we're going to go over the last strength here, and this is one, let me note here, that this strength and this position group is is probably the most comfortable of any position on the Buccaneers team. Like, the, the overall team, both sides of the ball. I'd say this is where we are the most comfortable and the most prepared for anything to happen. God forbid it does happen, because... It kind of already has started happening. But this is the Buccaneers' defensive line. The biggest weakness on the team last year. Pretty much went into the uh, went into the offseason last year. Did a complete overhaul of that front four. You replaced Chris Baker, Robert Ayers, and Clinton McDonald. And let me note that none of those guys are on an NFL roster right now. So, you know, something to think about. Keep an eye, keep an eye on Clinton McDonald in the Bucs, I'm just saying. Yeah. I, I, I'm just you know saying. what? I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be opposed to it because Clinton McDonald was always a guy who would go out there and do work, and you know he did ultimately have a pretty good two-game stretch last year well, when he was starting there. Yeah, I mean, McCoy, I'm just saying. Sorry, go ahead. The report came out. The report came out that Vita Vea is not going to be. He yeah. might not be ready. Okay, so and then you have Gerald Worthy who's the last defensive tackle. I think Clint McDonald's better than Gerald Worthy. So just I didn't mean to interrupt you but just something to just look out for. It. Don't be I'm not saying it's going to happen but don't be surprised if it would happen. Oh yeah. 
And uh, Vita Vea not being ready is something I was going to bring up here in a second. Um, but back to what happened with the defensive line this offseason. You got Gerald McCoy some help with JPP, Vinnie Curry, and Bo Allen. And then you've got depth at that same position with another talent pool all on itself with Vita Vea, who we just found out obviously is not going to be playing the first Most game. likely, yeah. Will yep, Golston, yeah, mo most likely. Will Golston, Noah Spence, and Mitch Unrein. We brought up Mitch Unrein, but let's talk about Noah Spence really quick because I had a big question mark next to Noah Spence here. We didn't see a whole lot of him from the preseason. Are you worried? A little. Um, I mean, second, I mean, third I... string guys were, were were stopping him. Yeah, I I am. It's a, it's, it is concerning, uh, but. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. There's something not right because, I mean, as a rookie, this guy had six sacks. You know, um, I think the Buccaneers would take six sacks from Noah Spence this year. But, I mean, he had a good game in Miami. But other than that, the other three games have not been very good. Um, especially since, just like you brought up, I mean, he was playing in the fourth quarter against the Jaguars. And he was going up against tackles that were prob are probably unemployed right now, yeah. and he couldn't do anything. Um, it is concerning, but I hope he gets his head right. I think he's got all the talent in the world, just hasn't put it together. Now, you know, preseason is preseason, so, so a lot of people could say that it is too early to be looking at it like this, but it's a very realistic concern because, you know, as we did bring up second and third string guys, yada, yada, yada. But one thing that pops into my head when thinking about Noah Spence and, and why he can't seem to get anything going, do you think it's simply adjusting to playing it, it this weight? Because he's 30 pounds heavier than he was last year and the year before. And the year before when he was on the field, you know, he had so much time off, gained all this weight, pretty much a, a different build of an outside linebacker, DN. You know, is it, is it hard to adjust, do you think? Uh, I mean, for the amount of times that he's done it, yeah. I mean, his weight has gone up and down so many different times. But I'm sure this is the heaviest he's ever played. Y yeah, but I, is it best for him, though? Like, what was his weight the rookie season? Because I know the rookie season, and then he lost weight, and then he just gained weight. Right. I mean, he hasn't played a season where he's had the same weight. Hasn't played one season. Let me get. Let and, me hit up Google real quick. I'll get you on his uh, starting weight in the league here in a second. <laughs> And, I mean, like I said, he had a, a, his rookie campaign, he had six sacks. Why wouldn't I, – I, I sort of blame the Bucks for that. Why would the Bucks tell him to lose weight? If it works, it works. And now, I mean, his his diet and his meal plans and his weight, they're all over the place, and it might be having a little effect on him. Right. So, right now, I believe he last weighed in at 263 pounds. Um Right around 260, 265 is where they've got him bulked up to coming into this season. His rookie year, I think he was playing around 225, 230. Because he's bu he bulked up about 35 pounds. So if you say that he's floating around there, I'm going to guess that rookie season he's playing around 220. You compare 220 to 265, that's almost 50 pounds. And whether you're an athlete or not, that's a lot of weight to be lugging around. And if they're looking to use you as a speed rusher, I, I just... I don't know. It, it, I don't know. In my head, it just makes me think that, you know, that's the biggest adjustment for him right now and, and something to get over headed into the season. But he did make the team. He is on um, – he did make the team. He's not on IR or anything. So no. He, he nope. should be good to go. He, he's, he's 100% healthy, which has been an issue with him as well. I, I think that might, that might be – that might be taking an impact as well. I mean, he's – he really hasn't uh, – Really hasn't had a season where he's been 100% healthy. He had yeah. six sacks his rookie season, but he got injured his rookie season. He had a strip sack in week one versus the Bears last year, but got injured in the next few plays and was out for the season. Yeah. Now moving on to the Buccaneers' weaknesses. Got a couple here. One of them I'm going to have a little bit more to say, but this first one will be the Buccaneers' secondary, the cornerback position in particular. You look at this position group, you got a lot of young guys, and Brent Grimes, who was okay during camp, um, had a little bit of an injury to start. Got burned a few times, which was a bit concerning, but yeah, he's, he's going to be fine. 
He's going to be fine, but at 35 years old, he cannot do it all by himself. And as I brought up, you've got a lot of young guys on this roster. These are all guys who are going to be playing under pressure because they're going to have to help him out. These are guys like VH3 who has got to step up this year because if he doesn't, he's gone. Mm -hmm. MJ Stewart and Carlton Davis, who were both rookies. So to put that much weight on those guys to pretty much hold down that position, we've seen some talent. From MJ Stewart and Carlton Davis, I really like what we've seen from them, but I don't know if it's going to be enough to hold the ship there for that whole position the whole year, especially if one of these guys goes down on injury. Well, it's going to be interesting. It's, I mean, because like Scott Reynolds said in his in his uh, strengths and weaknesses thing, um, I mean, besides Brent Grimes. The other corners are Vernon Harkins, MJ Stewart, Ryan Smith, Carlton Davis. I thought Ryan Smith got cut. No, Ryan Smith. Ryan Smith's there. Okay, my bad. Um, yeah, yeah. Ryan Smith is going to be the the fifth corner. So, got it. Um, and slash special teams gunner. That's why Josh Robinson was cut. Um, so basically, Reynolds just said it's all those guys. There's, there's four cornerbacks there. Ryan Smith, Carlton Davis, Vernon Hargraves, MJ Stewart. Vernon Hargraves is the only one with the interception. Ryan Smith doesn't have a pick. Carlton Davis and MJ Stewart are rookies. And so what, what – like, you you have to hope Brent Grimes doesn't get hurt. And then guess what? This offseason, you're probably going to – I mean, I don't think – I don't think they view Vernon Hargraves as a number two corner even anymore. I really don't. I think they think he could be a really good nickel corner, but I think they view Carlton Davis as their number two guy, who Carlton Davis during practice today was actually working as the number two corner alongside Brent Grimes. Um, he took over where Ryan Smith was. So I think they think Ver Hargis could be nickel. I think they think MJ Stewart can be nickel. And this team has to hit cornerback in the offseason. I mean, I know it's not season that even started already, but I mean, Brent Grimes, I would say I'm 95% sure this is going to be his last season. Yeah. And, I mean, unless Carlton Davis or MJ Stewart or even Vernon Hargreaves, I mean, that's what the Bucks are really hoping. They really want Vernon Hargreaves to, to come around. Yeah. Um, they probably want that. They want more success for Hargreaves than they do for any other corner probably right now. Um, but... I mean, if, if those guys, if they don't produce, what are you going to do? You, you got to you gotta sign somebody. You got to trade for somebody. So it's definitely interesting, but things can change. Vernon and Hargraves can come out and have five interceptions, and all of a sudden you're looking, oh, Brent Grimes retired, but they have Vernon Hargraves, Carlton Davis, MJ Stewart. They're fine, you know? So cornerback is definitely, definitely a weakness, but I wouldn't say it's the weakest link. And I think what you're going to get to next is probably the weakest link. And, um... It, maybe, maybe. Um, now, going back to Ryan Smith, who I, I didn't know was still on the team until a couple of seconds ago, you know, he did make the team, um, so he wasn't bad enough to not make the team, but Ryan Smith looked pretty bad those first two games against Miami yeah. and Tennessee. And, you know, I, I remember we sat there and said, like, wow, he really doesn't look that good. He did make the team, but... I don't know, man. I'm I'm honestly surprised that you know they would move him into that special teams position and cut Josh Robinson because I did really like Josh Robinson and what he brought to the table on special teams. I thought that unit was one of the better things on the team for the past couple of years. But cornerback position definitely going to need some help this coming season. Now, you might be right, you might be wrong, but what I've got next here is the Buccaneers' biggest question mark. I'll say that. But the linebacker position... Now, you can say that we have Quan, we have Levante David, we're fine. We know Quan and Levante are one of the best duos in the league right now, but we need to see these guys stay healthy because if they go down, you don't have a lot They're of depth screwed. behind them. You've got Kendall Beckwith, who is pretty much set to miss five games. He's on the inactive list. Um, and then behind them, you've got Cameron Lynch and, and rookie Jack Psyche. And really, to me, those guys are just kind of unproven in a big position like that. You know, you yeah. can't. You can't put your whole core on on those guys. Uh, aside from aside from Cameron Lynch and, and Jack Psyche, I believe you've got Darius Taylor as well. But these are all guys we've never really seen in this position all too much. And you know, uh, again, 
kind of like the cornerback position, you're putting a little bit of pressure on a rookie if they do decide to start psyche, God forbid anything happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, actually this wasn't what I was I was thinking you were going in a different direction. So Yeah. I, it's I, not I, the weakest <laughs> it's not the weakest thing on my thing. But it is I do agree that it is a big question mark. Um, they do have obviously Levante David Quan Alexander, then they do have um, Cameron Lynch who they kept uh, Jack Sitchy and Sitchy, uh, is that it? Not Psyche? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's Sitchy. Okay. Um, I haven't heard it pronounced any any other way. Something so. with these rookie names, man. <laughs> um, well, at least I mean, I used to like before the season like even started. I called like Vita Vea, like Vita Vea, like Vita Vea. <laughs> um, anyways, um, and then they have they Riley Bulla got injured so they sort of waved him injured so they recent injury settlement with him uh, there was a few other guys i do believe i'm not sure if darius taylor made it i think he did i didn't really hear anything that he didn't yeah um but he's i mean he's a good player but he's a reminder he's also coming off an injury so and then like you said they do have kendall beckwith but i mean yeah they need somebody to step up and i think it's going to be either cameron lynch or um, a Darius Taylor who's going to get that third linebacker spot. And they need somebody to step up. And, you know, I mean, you don't have to play great. You just can't be that bad. Or you can't get injured because if Quan Alexander or Levante David get injured, they're probably going out and signing a, a linebacker because yeah. you just can't. I mean, even if Beck was back, he, he can't do it. So you had said that you, you thought I was going to go another direction with the weakness. So. Uh, you must Swerved have, me. You must have a little bit to say there. Uh, talk us through it, man. What are you thinking? Well, I think the biggest weakness on his team is safety. Um, I mean, I think that's the release Keith Tandy, which I yeah, don't like. I, I'm still wrapping my head around that one, man. Um, I don't really know why. I like Isaiah Johnson, but do I like him more than Keith Tandy? No. Now I'm not one of those guys that say, oh, Keith Tandy got cut, but Conti, uh, okay. No. Conti's here for a reason. Tandy could have stayed. Isaiah Johnson could have gone. You might have been able to put Isaiah Johnson on the practice squad, whatever. Uh, you know, so now you have Justin Evans, who is, is going to be ready for week one. He's practicing normal today. He's he's a go for week one, uh, which is great news because, like I said, I'm about to get to, you know, it's the biggest weakness. You don't want to have your best safety go down. So, um, you know, Justin Evans and Chris Conti, who we hear, we don't hate Chris Conti, but we don't love him. Um, I don't think he's that good, but he's not as bad as people say he is. That's that. That's my. I think he's just on about him. average. Uh, yeah, I think, I think he's, he's he's average. He a, he's average, and he has some moments that are below, and some moments that are above. And the thing that I like about Chris Conti, and I think the reason that he has kind of won me over as a fan because I used to hate him. I remember after the Oakland game a couple of years ago, I wanted his head on a silver platter. Um, and, and I've brought this story up here a couple of times, so I'm not going to get that far into it. But he has won me over because what I've noticed about Chris Conti is that he is pretty much our final line of defense. I mean, he's the safety position, so, like, no duh. But, you know, he's finishing plays. He's making tackles. He's busting his ass to get from one end of the field to the other faster than anyone else I can really see in that secondary to finish plays. And that's something I do admire because there is a clear effort there. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. I, I don't really. He's, I he don't, is what he is. I don't hate him for that. I don't, <laughs> I yeah, I don't hate him for that. that that's one of the reasons I, I kind of like him. But I kind of don't like him because there is a lot of blown coverages. And, um, you know, there, there's a few things that, that shouldn't happen if you're starting safety but but they do sometimes with him uh, but you know it's a give and take thing so anyways you got chris conti and then you got the rookie jordan whitehead who flashed during the preseason everybody's saying we'll put justin evans at jordan whitehead look they're not going to put jordan whitehead out there a rookie week one versus drew Brees. they're not going to do that okay um they're not going to put him out in the first three games okay because then you face drew Brees. You face Carson Wentz because I think Carson Wentz is going to play week you two. Think Wentz just, is playing, just, huh? just a hunch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they said Foles is playing today. Today they said Foles is playing on Thursday. I think Wentz is going to be ready for week two. And then you play Ben Roethlisberger. So 
I yeah. don't think they're gonna they're not gonna throw out a rookie safety for the first three games and have Justin Evans, who is only a one year player. It's not like he's a five year, six year veteran and a rookie safety. So Jordan Whitehead can make progress and he can start, and I think he will start at some point this season. Okay, I, I think I think this will probably be Chris Conti's last season as a buck. Really, and I think largely in part because I think Jordan Whitehead's going to do good. And I think they're going to look to maybe maybe even get a, just another starting safety if they don't feel 100% comfortable with Whitehead just yet. Um, but I do think Jordan Whitehead's going to end up overtaking Chris Conti, and I think they're going to end up releasing him or trading him something. Uh, his contract might be up, actually, so I'll you're have to gonna, check on that. You're going to make a lot of people happy with that quote, just so you know. <laughs> you're going to have yeah. a lot of people like you after this show. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> I, 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 Yeah, no, I'm just saying. I, I, I just... You know what, I'm what I think. Of the people. Yeah, you know I, <laughs> I I listen to what they want and and I am a, a I am a yes man. I <laughs> I I do whatever it takes to get people to love me. I don't want them to hate me at all. No, trust me, I, I get a I get a ton of hate. Um, anyways, and then you got Isaiah Johnson, who is a pure was a pure special teams guy. He hasn't really seen much at safety. He did play well in the last two preseason games though, uh, which I think really won him that job over Tandy, but. I don't know. To me, the Tandy move's still questionable. Chris Conti is eh. Justin Evans is good, but Justin Evans is still a little bit inexperienced. Jordan Whitehead's a rookie. It, it worries me. It does. Oh, especially with you. especially with Brent Grimes being your only a corner, too. Because corners and safeties got to work hand in hand. And, yeah, the secondary as a whole is concerning, but our, the, the safeties are, are definitely more concerning to me than, than the corners. Okay, and I can agree with you on there, saying, you know, safety is probably the biggest question mark this team does have. But I'd say the overall theme with every position except for maybe defensive line, you guys got to stay healthy. And having a bye week this year is obviously going to help us out with staying healthy. Well, but, I mean, even defensive line. The, the depth of defensive line's already being tested. Oh, yeah, and it is. Um you know, I'd like to give it a pass a little bit because you do have talent all across the board there, as we brought up earlier. But still, it is a a, um, a questionable position, uh, questionable position to be in when you've got guys getting hurt. So guys got to stay healthy this season, and the Buccaneers have to find a way to do that because we have a lot of guys who are going to be missing some game time. But let's jump into our final segment of the show. We're going to go over some notable cuts. Uh, notable guys who are not on the team anymore and pretty much update you on who's still here, uh, whether it's the practice squad or the practice squad. Um, so we're going to go over that really quick here. I've got some notes in front of me. We're going to go over some key players, almost list them as bullet points, and then just kind of have a few comments about each. First up, it's quarterback Austin Allen. He was cut. Um, I don't have a lot to say about Austin Allen there. It's kind of a move I saw coming. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, moving on down the list, we've got quarterback, cornerback, JV and Elliott. Now, JV and Elliott didn't see a whole lot out of him, but he's a guy who's managed to stick around, and I, I remember following him a little bit last season and taking a bit of a liking to him. Now, honestly, I expected him... Uh, he he is on the practice squad. He is on the practice squad. He is on the practice squad, but he, he's a guy that I did like. Um, so he is going to be sticking around on the practice squad. Up next, we've got wide receiver Dante Adai. Um, now, where is he at now? He's gone. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, Dante Adai is... Because I've got the list of cuts. I just don't... Uh, I've got the list of cuts, but I don't remember who made the practice squad yeah. or not. Honestly, the the Bucks have been the only team besides... I think the Bucks have... Yeah, they've been the only team that's picked up Dai, like, repeatedly. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they picked him up next year too, just just for competition. Because they, this coaching staff, they like guys that they're comfortable with, and Dirk Cutter knows Dante Die for Winston's rookie season. Yeah. And Dante Die had a pretty productive year, and then he came to the 2016 training camp and lost out. You know, so it, it sucks for Die. I, I like Die; he's a good good dude, um, talented player, talented not the player, last but. See of him. Yeah, talented player, but I mean there was there was better options there. So. Yeah. And moving on down the list, we've got running back there, Ogan Bowale. Uh, I, I got to say that one out every, go. Time, every time. Not, I think I got not, it. Not, not, it's not Dare Bear anymore, guys. It's not Dare Bear. 
moving on from Dare Bear. Dare Ogan. He's Kong. also on the practice squad. Yeah, he did make the practice squad. He's a back that I honestly do like. What we saw from him out of Miami, I think he was running with a purpose. He did fall off, I'd say, after the second game. Didn't see any flashes from him that I remember. I didn't watch a whole yeah. lot of the Jaguars game. Well, after after the second game, that third game and the fourth game kind of became the Sean Wilson show. So. Yeah, and you can see there when comparing the two, Sean Wilson making the team, it's it's obvious as to why. Um, but Dare, he was a good, solid back, and I'm glad he is sticking around. Wide receiver Bernard Reedy, he does not make the team. He is cut. And I wanted Reedy to stick around because, as we had brought up before, he kind of brought that dual threat where – you know, if he is a receiver, he's a quick guy, but just a returner. Because now, without Bernard Reedy, I'm sure they have other returners lined up. You've got guys like Hump as well, who we've seen get in the return game. But you've got Deshaun Jackson, who is, in this case, I'd say he's a liability, but he's very liable to get hurt on a punt return, in, in my opinion. And Maybe, yeah. You know, you take away Bernard Reedy, who is just as solid of a returner, I would say. It kind of leaves a hole there or a concern maybe yeah for concern well maybe sean wilson can take that spot that's true we did see a little bit of sean wilson in the return game over the preseason moving on to another wide receiver who was just as involved in that wide receiver race that is bobo wilson jr i like bobo everybody seems to really like bobo wilson every time he comes back around well they're all fsu fans yeah yeah and i'm right now I'm a Penn State slash Florida State fan. Right now, I'm wearing, right now, currently wearing my Florida State polo because they play at night. But, what was up with uh, um, What was up with Penn State? Didn't they almost <laughs> lose to? They almost lost. Yeah, to Appalachian <laughs> State. Like, oh my god, dude, that was horrible. I was like, I thought they were gonna lose. I really did, but thank God they didn't. And I hope Florida State can pull out the big win tonight <laughs> against the uh, Virginia Tech. DeAndre Francois is back, so he's like one of my favorite quarterbacks. So I think one um, of my I think one of my favorite things about college football coming back is just following Twitter during the games because it's almost as exciting funny. as just funny. watching the game. Yeah. There's yeah. so much going on, you know, the whole App State Penn State thing. Um, Everybody was saying about Miami last night, you know, yeah. like how their their uniforms were made of recycled trash while that's other <laughs> plan or something like that. So, yeah. Um, why were they ranked number eight? By the way, I don't know. Like, <laughs> buy into the hype. Like, I don't. I I hate those preseason rankings. I think nobody should be ranked at all until you play at least like three or four games. But, anyways, back to the Bucks because this isn't. <laughs> you know, this is the CFP stands for Cannon Fire Podcast, not College Football Podcast. So, <laughs> good one. Um, good one. That was off the dome. I wasn't thinking of that. <laughs> anyways, moving on. Uh, down. Yeah, Bobo Wilson. Sorry. He, he he's good. He's he's on the practice squad. He's good. Uh, that's why he got put on the practice squad. They want to continue working with him, and I think they really left the door open. I think they want him to take that sixth wide receiver spot eventually. Maybe next year if he doesn't get picked up by somebody. But yeah. when you have Jameis Winston saying he's Jameis Winston's also at FSU, but when you have Jameis Winston saying you know he's like a mini Antonio Brown, I mean that that doesn't that's not you know. He's, He's not, not just saying throwing that name out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and I mean, I like I said, I'm an FSU fan. I'm not an FSU homer. Yes, <laughs> did I want did I want Dalvin Cook? Yes. I don't know if I wanted Derwin James because I really wanted Bradley Chubb. But I was I, ready for well, Derwin I, James. I'll say that as a Florida I, Gator fan, I was ready for Derwin James. I was I was prepared for Derwin James, but I don't know if, if I if I wanted him more. That's not who I wanted, but I was prepared. I thought they were going to take Derwin James. Well, I guess we were um, both let down because. Well, oh well, <laughs> Vita Vey is here, man. Vita Vey is here. Um, anyways, you know, Bobo, he's he's a good player. It's just it's a stacked wide receiver room. It just yeah. is, you know. And I understand why they picked Martino over Wilson. And like I said, I'm not an FSU homer. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh my god, what are they doing? picking Martino over Wilson. I understand it. But I do think Bobo is going to be back next year, and I think he's going to have another good camp. He had a good camp this year, a good preseason. Uh, in the early going, he was the leader for the fifth wide receiver spot, but fell off uh, towards the end because he had that injury. Um, yeah. He had that injury, which catch him, kept him out, I believe, in the Tennessee game, and then kept him out a few days of practice. So that hurt him, but he'll be back. He'll be all right. 
And moving on, wrapping up the list here of guys who were let go. Two safeties. First one, Josh Robinson, which kind of did let me down because, you know, as I brought up before, I really did like what he brought to the table with the special teams unit. It seemed like he had one or two highlights every single year. And I, I really I, I'm going to miss the creative ways they would find find ways to uh, down the ball at the one because there's some cool highlights there. And the other yeah, one. Well, Ryan is, Smith's still here. So, yeah. And the other one is safety Keith Tandy, which, you know, I think for everyone here uh, was probably the biggest shock on cut day. Of uh, true. Yeah. I mean, no doubt. I didn't expect that at all. I sort of, I didn't expect the Josh Robinson thing, but after looking at it, the Bucks saved about $2 million. So that's going to help them with negotiating with Quan Alexander, Ali Marpet, Donovan Smith, those guys. So I understood that. The Keith Tanny thing caught me completely by surprise. I mean, you didn't hear anything about him being in any danger. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I yeah, would it, not want to be Jason. I would not want to be Jason Light, really, because... Uh, that must have been tough because I think Jason Light, Jason Light really liked Tandy, and I think that Dirk Cutter, I think Dirk Cutter should have thanked Keith Tandy after after he cut him because, or maybe or before he cut him because without Keith Tandy, Dirk Cutter's not the head coach right now. Yeah, because it, you look Keith Tandy the, saved those two games. They yeah. saved those two games, and they would have been seven and nine. That would have been back to back losing seasons, and Dirk Cutter. I mean. You can't. You're fired. Five and eleven. They can't go. Oh, well, you went nine and seven. Okay, then five and eleven. No, you went seven and nine, and then five and eleven. That's yeah. You got you know a, a lot worse, and the, and they weren't in a position to be any better the season before. Now, looking at the Keith Tandy situation, can you rack your brain and just think of any possible reason or anything in particular? Because you know, when I sit down and I think about this, I, I as soon as I read the news, I was like, "All right, let me try and think of something." But like you said, there was no hint that he was in any immediate danger. So I don't know, man. What are you thinking? I think it's a combination of a few things. I think they like Isaiah Johnson. Isaiah Johnson's younger. Keith Tandy's twenty nine years old. I mean, people don't realize that he was he was one of the longest tenured bucks. I mean, DeMar Dotson right now, DeMar Dotson and Gerald McCoy are the two longest right now, but he was like the second, like the third or fourth longest because yeah, he's been he was drafted 2013 or 2012, actually, I believe. Yeah, I think it was 2012. Um, he didn't play much in his rookie season. Uh, yeah, but he's 29 years old. I guess it might save him some money. Um, Initially, and a lot of Bucks fans are gonna be like getting mad at me now because like I didn't say anything. But initially, <laughs> I thought they were signing a, a free agent safety at, yeah. at first. But then, but then once I I heard from a few sources that Isaiah Johnson had made the roster, I said okay, that's out because I knew they were gonna carry four safeties. I said okay, now that Tandy's gone, I said that's three. I said it's either there. Are, it's either they're keeping Isaiah Johnson or they're signing somebody. And I honestly thought they were going to sign somebody. But, you know, they like Isaiah Johnson. you got to trust them. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, you look at the situation now. Everything is said and done. Nothing we can do about it. But moving on, the Buccaneers are on the road in six days against division rivals New Orleans at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And, oh, man. I am the, uh, Merce the, the Mercedes Benz the Superdome. Superdome. There you go. Let me, the yeah, stadium let me is the is the Falcons I, one now. I knew I screwed that up. That's messed up. That Mercedes Benz that. is sponsoring two stadiums, especially they're getting the same money. Division. <laughs> they're getting money. Yeah, but you don't. I don't know. I just don't think of any other sponsors I, like Raymond James doesn't have an arena somewhere. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know. Mercedes Benz is a little too greedy with the sponsorship money there. But <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That's just about going to do it for this episode of the Cannon Fire Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, whether it's on YouTube, iTunes, or Google Play Music. You can follow the show on Instagram at Cannon Fire Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Cannon Fire Pod because you can't put podcast because there's not enough characters there. Um, you can so, check out. So the hey, Rhett, so hey, Rhett, put you yeah. on the spot right now. Are the Bucks winning? Are the Bucks winning next week? Yeah. Uh, against New Orleans? No. Okay. No. All right. 
Evan, are the Bucks winning? Yeah, no. No. Okay. no All right. No, 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 no. I mean, it kind of sucks to sit here and say that and hype everybody up for the season, but I'm glad we are in a glad we're in agreement here. And, and as we wrap things up here, you can follow my co-host Evan at Bucks Football. Uh, you can also find him at Bucks Wave, formerly Bucks Football. A whole, whole lot of shenanigans going <laughs> <Yeah>. on there <laughs> on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, check out our partners at PewterReport.com for some of the best Bucks coverage in the game. And check out our sponsors at CoolTowel.com. I am Rhett, signing off for Evan, and we'll see you next time. Go Bucks! <laughs>